Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kishore Mahubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And it gives me great pleasure to invite you to join us for this public lecture uh, by Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia uh, today. Uh, I'm just going to be very brief in my remarks. I'll say something about the school, something about the topic, and something about our speaker. Um, and about the school, I suspect some of you, especially the students, have heard me uh, say lots of things about the school. Let me, each time I speak to you all, say something different about the Lee Kuan Yew School that you may not have, a fact that you may not have heard about. And today I decided that the fact I will choose to select with you, to share with you today, is about our role in promoting studies on not China, not studies on India, but studies on where China and India meet. <coughs> and in that area, Montag, I hope that we, our school will try to become the number one uh, in the world. Because, you know, we believe, and we, we remain very confident, that just as from the years 1 to the year 1820, the two largest economies in the world were consistently those of China and India, in the 21st century, China and India will come back again and be the two largest economies in the world. And when that happens, of course, the relations between China and India will become very important. Even if this may not happen for another two, three decades, we've decided to make an investment, a long-term investment in studying this relationship. So uh, when you go back to India, Montag, and I'm glad his wife Isha is here with us, I hope you will mention that if you want to study the China-India relationship, come and come to the Lee Kuan Yew School uh, of Public Policy. And we, by the way, have had several relatively high-level uh, Track 1.5, Track 2 meetings between former Indian officials and Chinese officials in our school. We produce a China-India brief, so if you go to our website and you look at it, uh, you get some very useful briefs on what's happening within China and India. So these are the sort of contributions that our school is doing uh, to promoting understanding in this area. And of course, when you have a distinguished speaker like Dr. Montek Singh Aluwadia, it also adds to the work that our school uh, is doing. The second point I'm going to make is about the, the topic. And I, I must say, I can't think of a more timely topic uh, for us to address today because, as you know, uh, there's always something that becomes fashionable in the media from time to time. And one of the things that has become fashionable in the media is to say, hey, you know, the emerging markets, we talked about it a lot, but now the story is over. And that's how the phrase, as you know, was, was recently uh, become fashionable in the media, is a fragile five. Right? And I'm glad that I, I, I happen to have a brief glimpse of the slides that uh, Dr. Montex thing is going to show. Uh, share with us and you will see some discussion of the Fragile Five and I hope you'll address the issue of the day and, and I think clearly it's a, one of the most pressing issues that we have to deal with today. Finally, a quick word on the speaker. The great advantage of introducing a speaker as well known as Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia because I can genuinely say he needs no introduction. Uh, he belongs to a very elite group of economists, you know, uh, who, who meet with each other, who talk to each other, and his friends include people like uh, Amatya Sen, uh, uh, Martin Wolf, uh, Jagdish Bhagwati, and they, and in part the elite circle that Montek uh, belongs to, and, and uh, he's made enormous contributions in this field for many, many years. He, but just for a brief history of his background, he received his bachelor's from Delhi University and later won a Rhodes Scholarship to pursue a Master's in Economics at Oxford. And after his studies, he joined the World Bank, and this is, this is relevant information for our students, as a young professional, later going on to hold various positions in the organization, including Chief of the Income Distribution Division at age 28, becoming the youngest ever Division Chief in the World Bank's history. I hope that someday a student from Lee College School will beat that record of yours. <laughs> In then 1979, he joined the government of India as an economic advisor in the Ministry of Finance before going on to hold many other senior positions. 
Then he went to the IMF to become the first director of the IMF New Independent Evaluation Office in 2001. And in 2004, uh, when uh, the Congress Party won the elections, he came back to India and he assumed the role of Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, a post he's held for, I guess, almost 10 years now. And in 2011, he was conferred the Padma Vibhushan Award for his contribution to public service by the President of India. We are tr truly blessed that we have such a gifted uh, a public intellectual and public official to address us today. So, Montek, the floor is yours. Kishore, friends, ladies and gentlemen, students, other distinguished invitees. Kishore, thank you very much for a truly undeservedly fulsome introduction. I mean, that's what friends are for. <laughs> uh, now, I'm really delighted to be here uh, to give this lecture. It's not my first lecture at the school, uh, but it's nice to do it again. And I have to say that uh, I'm particularly grateful to Kishore for actually suggesting the subject. I mean, you know, I very often get invited to give lectures in India. And these days, of course, India, like all other economies, has slowed down. So I've given endless lectures on why that's happened, etc. Uh, and it was really nice to have the opportunity to set the India story in a much larger context of what's happening in emerging markets. Now, I think the um, broadest, the simplest thing to do, uh, Kishore wanted me to speak for only 30 minutes and allowing enough time for Q&A. So I'm going to be as brief as possible. And the main thing I want to do is take you over some slides that will actually summarize uh, the emerging market story, and also put it in some context of how is it that you know all this hype built up, and then all of a sudden you've got a very very negative perception. So um, let me go to the first. Th this summarizes everything, and uh, the main main point I think I want to make is that you know uh, I think a lot of the reason why you have this uh, uh, hyped up. Uh, positive picture followed by a negative picture is that you know the emerging market story has been mainly told by investment analysts. It's not been told by economists who are looking at long-term trends, etc. Uh, and I mean investment analysts tend to have a shorter term focus and they have to respond very quickly to whatever's currently happening. I think that's quite important to understand what actually happened. You know, the term emerging markets was invented in 1981 by Antoine Van Aktmeil, who was then an investment officer in the International Finance Corporation, then became a very, very successful investment banker. And his focus, uh, the reason he called them emerging markets, he was really focusing on the fact that in the developing countries, there are actually a lot of companies that are doing very well. So his concern was, don't bother about the overall prospects of developing countries. He wasn't actually saying, that the developing countries are going to do very well. What he was saying is there's a lot of value in some individual companies. So the focus was very much on companies. But you know, it's not easy to tell people to invest in companies that are in developing countries. So as a PR gimmick, he called them emerging markets. I and mean, that's what he's that's what he told me why he used the term emerging markets. And you know, as a matter of fact, if you look at the 80s and you look at the 90s, I've got uh, four, the four or five different categories here. I've got the advanced economies, uh, the emerging markets and developing countries as a group, uh, the emerging markets excluding China. This is extremely important because China has been such a good performer that a lot of the data on emerging markets actually dominated for some time by Chinese economic performance. And then I've got China and India. And of course the differences uh, between those groups and advanced economies. So some very broad trends I think that I want to focus on. One is that the advanced economies are showing a secular downtrend. From a growth rate of 3.1% in the 80s, they went down to 2.8 in the 90s, went down to 2.6 before the crisis, and even lower to 0.7 in the years after the crisis. So it's clear that in the global economies, the advanced economies are going through a secular downtrend in growth. 
That is a reflection of all kinds of factors, aging, etc. They are the front, they are the frontier of technology. There's a lot of competition coming from developing countries, and there's no reason to believe that that trend is actually going to go down. Uh, most recently, they've recovered from virtually zero growth uh, for three years after the first crisis and managed to get one and a half. And I don't think that in the future they'll actually do much better than that. I think the U.S. will do better. Europe has got lots of problems. Japan has the usual problems of aging. So 1.5, maybe a little more than that, that's what's going to happen. Now, if you look at emerging markets uh, and developing countries all put together, they have actually been accelerating, except for the period after the crisis when they decelerated. But if you separate that out between the emerging markets, excluding China and, and China, then you get a much different picture. China has grown very, very rapidly, and it has also decelerated, but its deceleration is at to much higher levels. The emerging markets, excluding China, in the 80s and the 90s, actually grew slower than the advanced economies. I mean, if you take the emerging markets as a whole, they grew faster than the advanced economies, but that was in the 80s and 90s, but that was dominantly because of China. If you take out China, then that whole group actually grows slower. India actually grows faster than the advanced economies in that period, not as fast as China, well behind China, but all of them together, much less so. Now, I think the hype about emerging markets really began in the year 2000, and once again was triggered by investment analysts. I mean, Jim O'Neill of Goldman Sachs, leading a very young team of researchers, picked on these four countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, the big countries, and projecting forward much longer than normal investment analysts do, uh, they came to the conclusion that these countries were actually going to accelerate in their growth, whereas the advanced countries were going to remain slow growing. And they viewed that as a structural change that was occurring mainly because these are countries that lag behind in productivity compared to the advanced economies, but they had achieved the level where catching up was possible. I mean, if you lag behind and you haven't developed the ability to catch up, nothing much happens. But if you're lagging behind historically, and you've now developed some of the institutions and the human skills required to do a catch up, then their basic assumption was that convergence will take place. These economies will grow rapidly uh, and will actually end up coming very close to the levels of the developed economies. They would overtake them in growth rates, but not necessarily in levels. And in fact, they made a projection which said that China would actually overtake the United States by 2041 in terms of total GDP. Not per capita GDP, but total GDP. And China and India, would, so you'd have number one in 2041, number one would be China, number two, very close, uh, would be the United States. India was projected to overtake Japan by 2035 so that by 2040, uh, the ranking would be China number one, the US number two, and then India well behind. I mean, I have to emphasize that there's a considerable lag between number two and number three, but it, tra India will have overtaken all the other G7 countries uh, over that period. This was the basic projection which they made, and you know, the article is actually quite uh, carefully argued. It says, assuming all these countries follow sound policies. But you know, somehow that bit was ignored, and everybody interpreted that to mean that developing countries are now well set to grow rapidly no matter what, and there's some natural process of conversions. And the fact is that in the year 2000, in the 2000s, up to, up to the global crisis, if you look at 2000 to 2007, uh, it really did look as if the emerging market countries were doing extremely well. I mean, the advanced economy countries grew at 2.6. The emerging markets, excluding China, grew at 4.3, China at 10.5, India at 7.1. So it really looked as if, uh, as a matter of fact, both China and India in that period exceeded what Goldman Sachs said would be their growth during that period. So it looked as if the emerging markets are really taking over. 
Then, of course, you had the global crisis, a whole new ball game came up. Now, it's useful actually to look at the global crisis in two sub periods. I mean, I have 2008 to 2014, but it's best to look at the first period, which is 2008 to 2010, and then to look at the second period, which is 2011 to 13. Now, in the first sub period, what happened was that the advanced economies really collapsed. And you can see it was a very mild negative growth taking them all together. The emerging markets, on the other hand, seem to be doing quite well. I mean, they're barely affected by the global, uh, uh, the global slowdown. Uh, within that, China actually doing better than previously. India also doing better than previously in the first few years. And the emerging markets, excluding China, also doing a little bit better. Now, I think it is in that period that the myth grew that something dramatically different is happening to the world. The, emerged, the advanced economy is no longer growing, so that old model that they are the engine of growth and everybody then follows was no longer true. Uh, the developing countries seem to be going along quite well without the advanced economies. And that's when you got phrases like decoupling, uh, and the IMF invented this phrase, two-speed recovery, meaning that the advanced economies are going to take some time to get back to normal, but meanwhile these other fellows are going to bound ahead, and you know, center of power shifting towards Asia, etc. A lot of very positive hype. Now, of course, during that period, there was no questioning of this. I mean, everybody, even the IMF said, yes, two-speed recovery. I think the last two, three years have been really quite uh, different in an important sense. If you look at the last row on that table, well, first of all, the advanced economies suddenly do better, you know, from a little negative, they go to 1.5. Now, 1.5 is nothing much to write home about. It's actually consistent with the secular decline that I talked about, especially since I don't really think that they're going to do much better than that in the years ahead. But from negative to 1.5, it meant the advanced economies were growing faster. Developing economies, on the other hand, actually slowed down. Now, China slowed down a little bit from 9.7 to 8.2. Uh, India slowed down a lot from 7.6 to 4.5. And this is the current debate going on in India that why is it that this slowdown took place. Other emerging market countries, excluding China, also slowed down. So this was a period when the advanced economies were doing better, and the emerging markets economies slowed down, even including China. Of course, India slowed down much more. And I think this is when, again, the investment, uh, the investment analysts struck again, because the story had changed, and therefore it needed to be explained. Now, just as Goldman Sachs uh, launched the positive spin on emerging markets, it's only appropriate that Morgan Stanley, my good friend Vijay Sharma, uh, launched the retelling of the emerging market story. So he, he wrote this book called Breakout Nations. And I mean, the basic thesis he's putting forward is not unreasonable. What he's saying is, look, there's no God-given sort of uh, manifest destiny for all emerging markets. Rather, you know, they're a mixed bag. And some of them will do very well, and others may not, depending on domestic policy. It's not very different, by the way, from what Goldman Sachs has said to begin with, because they have always said it all depends on policy. But given that things were turning out badly, uh, he said, well, policies are going to matter. And then of the BRIC countries, he said Brazil, and he said China is going to slow down because essentially the demographic dividend is over, uh, the nature of the global economy is not going to be consistent with China continuing with its older growth model, which was heavily dependent on exports. China would have to readjust to a much more domestic demand-given model, and that would pose some problems. So he saw China slowly uh, decelerating. Incidentally, Goldman Sachs has said the same thing earlier. I mean, no country can grow very, very rapidly forever. So the whole assumption is as you start succeeding in catching up, you sort of slow down. So China slowing down is not necessarily criticism of Chinese performance. It's just a validation of what everybody thought was going to happen anyway. Uh, he said that Brazil and Russia being both commodity-driven markets, 
The slowdown in China would make it tough for them to achieve high growth. And actually, they had not achieved very high growth during this period. I mean, Brazil and Russia are still in the 3 to 4 percent growth rate, not in the high growth rate period. And in India's case, uh, uh, Ruchiri said that India has a 50 percent chance of becoming a breakout nation. And there, the basic idea was, will India be able to uh, meet the new policy challenges that it faces. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute in some detail. But I think what, given all this, uh, what one needs to ask is, what exactly, therefore, is the emerging market story? In order to answer the question, is the emerging market story over? Uh, what are the main components of it that we should look at? Well, the first component is that the advanced economies are going to slow down. That remains as valid then as now. The fact that in the last three years they picked up doesn't mean that the advanced economies are set for a long haul of higher growth. They will be on a long haul of hopefully stable, but actually very modest growth. And their income levels are high enough, so they don't really need uh, to grow that much faster. So this is the first part of the story, which is certainly, which remains valid. Um, I think the implication of that is that, you know, in the, on the emerging market side, uh, many of the factors that have caused the emerging markets to grow faster, uh, they remain valid. Uh, higher rates of savings, higher rates of investment, lower levels of productivity, giving a chance to catch up. So we should expect to see a continuation of the trend. And let me just point to what the trend looks like. I mean, this is the changing share of advanced economies as a percent of world GDP uh, and, of, and the share of emerging markets and developing economies, including China and India. So you see a sharp reduction. Now, a little bit of a change here and there, but my feeling is that as long as the emerging markets kind of continue to grow uh, at the sort of rates they have grown, let's say in the year 2000, in 2000 up to 7, it was 6.5, then it slowed down 5.4. So if they grow at an average of 6%, then that curve will definitely converge. And, and you can ex the basic argument that the emerging markets are likely to account for 50% of the world economy by the year 2020 is amply borne out uh, by, by, by the data. So this part of the story actually remains valid. What we need to think about is uh, which are the countries that are actually going to be rapidly growing. And I think we have to recognize China has been an exceptionally successful developing economy in the sense that it has achieved 10 to 11 percent growth for 30 years. It's very important to realize some people think that, you know, if only we all were like China, we'll all grow at 10 to 11 percent. That's not true. I mean, th there are limits to growth, there are limits to how much developing country exports can be absorbed by advanced economies, there are resource limits. I think China has benefited from the fact that others didn't do what was necessary to compete effectively with China. Uh, so in future, what one expects to see is that if China restructures itself, uh, restructures its growth model to be less focused on exports, it'll create a lot more room for other developing countries to take space which China currently occupies. That'll help their growth rate. But even within these other countries, there's a lot of room for variation. And you may have a situation where the average of this group may be growing at 5 or 6%. Maybe some countries will grow rapidly for a while, and then they'll hit a block. Others will not, not grow, grow so rapidly. And the issue then arises, which are the countries that are most likely to grow rapidly and which not. Obviously, that depends on their individual circumstances. And in the current uh, rethinking, uh, because the global crisis is dominantly a macroeconomic crisis, uh, the vulnerabilities that people focus on are really the vulnerabilities on the macro side. I think Kishore mentioned uh, the Fragile Five. That's another Morgan Stanley invention. Uh, because and I'll give you the numbers on the fragility. Uh, these are just the standard numbers. Uh, this is the same. The chart shows exports of goods and uh, by both the advanced and developing economies behaves exactly like GDP. And these are the facts about the fragile five. Now, the fragile five that they have identified are India, Brazil, 
Indonesia, South Africa, and Turkey. Now, actually, in all of these countries, uh, of all of these countries, Brazil, uh, Indonesia has grown a little rapid, close to 6% very recently, but earlier was not growing that rapidly. South Africa has never actually gone much beyond 4%. Turkey has had a very uh, up and down kind of performance, and Brazil has really not gone much beyond it's between 3 and 4%, even lower than 3%. So what is it about the economies that actually stands out? Now, let me talk about the Indian case because I think in terms of growth rates, uh, the deceleration of growth in India has been very marked in the last three years. You know, the figures that I presented are actually IMF figures uh, and the growth assumptions the IMF uses uh, for its uh, estimates of growth, uh, GDP at market prices, whereas we use GDP at factor costs. So at factor costs, our growth rate is a little bit better. So if you read a lot of the Indian literature, they'll say it's a little below 5% or 5% or something. Uh, the IMF figures show it as lower. It doesn't matter which one you use. It's quite clear that there is a deceleration. I think it's quite clear from these numbers that India stands out in one or two ways. I mean, first, it had last year a very high current account deficit. Uh, higher than Brazil and Indonesia, but not higher than South Africa and Turkey. And I think this is an important issue, that you know, uh, how high a current account deficit is actually sustainable. I think in a world where there is a lot of volatility, uh, most people would say that current account deficits should really not exceed, some people would say 1 to 1.5%, one others would say 2%. Now, in order to retain that, uh, in order to observe that discipline, and at the same time have a high enough investment rate, because that's necessary. If you want to grow rapidly, you have to have a high investment rate. Then the savings rate has to be actually quite high. Now, the India's advantage over these other countries is that it has an investment rate of 35%, which actually is a decline from the previous three or four years when it was even higher. Indonesia has something close to that, but the other countries actually have a much lower investment rate. Now, this is linked to a much higher savings rate. Again, India and Indonesia are both rather similar. High savings rate, high investment rate. Whereas Brazil, South Africa, and Turkey have savings rates that are actually quite low. And unless you assume that you can sustain very high current account deficits, to fuel investment, uh, that is not really consistent with rapid growth. The real problem with India is the fiscal deficit. If you look, uh, that's the, uh, the column in, in red, and this is the fiscal deficit, not of the central government alone, but of the central and the provinces. And the fiscal deficit as high as 8.5% of GDP. I think in the last three or four years, the deterioration that occurred in the fiscal deficit has been a major factor uh, priming the view that there is macro fragility in India. This was itself to some extent the result of an effort to stimulate the economy in response to the first crisis. Now that stimulus for the first two or three years actually worked quite well, but I think in retrospect uh, it should have been withdrawn much earlier. And the fact that this is now, this is the official position, finance minister has said so, governor of the central bank has said so. Uh, and I think had we done that, then there would have been much less, uh, much less deterioration on the fiscal side. The other part of the uh, calculation is really the debt to GDP ratio. And India's debt to GDP ratio, like Brazil, is actually very high. The others are much lower. Now, you know, on debt, uh, we are hugely benefited by the fact that the advanced economies have managed themselves in a way where their debt to GDP ratio are much higher. I mean, they're above 100%. So if you look at places that are vulnerable, uh, in most of the developed countries, you're looking at debt ratios that are much, much higher than India. And you're looking at countries whose growth potential is much, much lower. So the only weak spot in India is really the fiscal deficit. If the fiscal deficit could be brought down, Given the high growth potential, the debt to GDP ratio would steadily fall. And that is what has been happening, actually, in the last uh, five or six years. So I think I come back to my main chart, 
the key question from India's, looking at it from India's perspective or from the perspective of someone observing India, is that you've got a record of growth rates between 6 and 7% in the last 10 years or so on average. That has come down to 45 is that due to some fundamental change uh, which ensures that it will remain low? Or is it due to some problems that have arisen which the government should actually get to address? Now, my view is that there were problems. It was not entirely due to the global slowdown. I mean, uh, China, for example, experienced a slowdown due to the global, uh, global factors. And that slowdown in the case of China was from 10.5% uh, to 9.7% uh, in the first in the first period, and in India's case, the same comparison between 2007 and the first three post-crisis years is from 7.1 to 7.6. So actually, India's growth rate accelerated in the first three years after the crisis, and that is almost certainly because there was an excess of fiscal stimulus, which shouldn't have been there. The consequence is a very sharp reduction in the next three years, which I think can be corrected. Uh, and we've done that before. So the basic message that comes out is that uh, policies can make the full difference, not just for India, but for all developing countries. So what are these policies? Now, in order to stay within, Kishore, I have five minutes? Yeah. So I'll just mention. Number one, quite clearly, for all countries, macroeconomic stability and strong financial institutions. I think we have to remember that macroeconomic stability in a closed economy uh, means one thing. In an open economy, it has to be linked to strong financial institutions because you can be buffeted with change globally and your institution must be able to handle that. So that's the, that's the macro dimension. Every developing country should really get that basic thing right. The second, which I've already mentioned, is a high domestic savings rate. I mean, if you want a high growth rate, you need to have a high investment rate. And it's not really possible to have a high investment rate just by running current account deficits year after year after year. So a high domestic savings rate with some allowance for uh, foreign inflows which fuel a little bit more uh, investment. Uh, to get that high um, savings rate, it's very important that A, inflation is low, and B, that the financial institutions that encourage savings being intermediated through the financial system are strong. So it's a, uh, both inflation matters and also institutions matter to mobilize savings. Third, a very strong private sector. I mean, everybody is running a market-oriented, private sector-based economy. I think India is quite well-placed in that. We have a strong private sector. It's shown lots of signs of dynamism. And I see no, I see no reason to believe that if the macro is brought under control, uh, that the private sector will not be able to do what we need. Four, good infrastructure. I mean, again, it's true for all developing countries. Actually, now you hear it's even true for developed countries. A lot of, if you read the Wall Street Journal, I mean, they're constantly saying in the United States that in order to improve the United States' competitiveness, we've neglected infrastructure. That is doubly and trebly so in developing countries, certainly in a country like India. So a big thrust has to be on improving infrastructure. And in infrastructure, I mean, it's energy and transport connectivity that probably are the most important. And from a policy point of view, to develop them, you have to have a lot of public-private partnership. So that's quite a, a mix of policy points on which you need to intervene. Fourth is the issue of ease of doing business. <clears throat> this has come into focus by the World Bank and others that developing countries need to be, need to be competitive. They need to make, uh, to make it much easier for businesses to function. Certainly true in India also. This is recognized in India, and we now have to get down to doing it. Uh, finally, all these countries have to manage critical transitions. I mean, life is not you just set one or two parameters and then you get growth. Rather, you set these parameters, you get growth, then you run into changes that are due to structural factors which create new challenges. In India's case, and I think this must be true for many countries, I think there are three challenges 
uh, that we need to manage. And these are long term in the sense that they have to be managed over the next 10 or more years. One is energy. India is not, India is an energy deficient country, so we are importers of energy. So that whole range of how do you make things more energy efficient? What are the regulatory and pricing decisions you have to take to achieve that? That should have high priority. Second is the area of uh, water, uh, a big constraining factor, again, not just true of um, India, equally true of China and many other countries. I think what, with the rapid growth of uh, industrialization, the demand for water in developing countries is really going to mount. And India has 16% of the world's population and 4% of the available fresh water. So we are certainly not uh, a category which has oodles of water. Uh, and there are lots of problems with how we handle water. I won't go into this, but I think that's a major structural challenge. I say it's a structural challenge in the sense that 10 years ago, if you looked at the country's plans, you wouldn't see very much about the complexity of managing water. The general approach was we need some more dams to build more reservoirs and whatever. But I think today there's a realization that it's much more complex. And finally, of course, is urbanization, which is picking up in India, picking up in virtually all other countries. I was in China just last week, and they brought out a document on urbanization. We certainly are at a point where there is going to be, there has to be and there should be, a structural transformation where maybe another 100 million people or so will have to get into, uh, will have to be provided for in urban areas. That process has already begun in India, but the providing for is a much bigger challenge uh, than is realized. I mean, partly because in India, uh, urban policy is not actually in any sense controllable by the central government. Uh, it falls in the realm of state governments. There are huge problems of technical capacity building, uh, empowerment of cities, things like that, without which it's difficult to imagine how solutions can be found. Now, what we know is that solutions are possible at a micro level. There are many examples where these solutions are being tried, but they have to be scaled up. And if we want to have a faster growth of investment, more uh, openness, bringing in foreign investors, etc., uh, a transformation of our cities uh, has to be high on the agenda. It's nice saying this in Singapore because you're the most transfer transformed urban environment over the last 20 years. Uh, we're nowhere near achieving anything like that, but I think we need to raise that in our consciousness. So it's a very big agenda. Some of these things are urgent. I mean, if we don't get the macro right within the next two years, the rest is academic. So the macro has to be made right first. Then one does the others in a different kind of sequence, uh, but it's a big agenda, but it can be done. The bottom line, I think, is that I find difficult to believe that if India has been growing around 7%, it runs into a block, that it won't be able to get back to 7%. I can assure you that the public's perception is that the present deceleration of growth rate is quite unacceptable. We are, of course, currently going through an election so we will have a new government in place at the end of May, and I have no doubt that whatever the government is in place, the first thing they will be asked and they will know they need to do is how do you get the growth rate back again. And it's not, uh, it's not something that is not that the answers are not known, that they are more or less along the lines I, I read off. And I just feel that when there is a new government in place, it will make it possible to quickly take a number of steps that will address some of these problems. I think if I'm to observe your limitation, I should promptly stop here and then let you take over the, the event. Okay. Let me begin by saying that, you know, uh, Monsek has been very, very generous to us. This is the second time, the third time we've spoken at our school. Second time. Second time. And but you visited our school, I know, uh, a few times. But the other, the other reason why he's being very generous is that he actually has a plane to catch at 8.40 p.m. going to Sydney. <laughs> so we'll have to end sharp at 6.30 to make sure he doesn't miss the G20 meeting uh, in Australia. And a G20 meeting without Montag will not be the same. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask the first question and then we'll throw the floor open to questions. But as I said, keep your questions short and sharp and focused and then we'll try and get as many in as possible. 
I'm going to begin by asking you, I guess, a slightly difficult question. You mentioned the election at the end, but you basically you didn't discuss politics. And at the end of the day, it's politics that is unfortunately one of the biggest constraints to carrying out the right economic uh, reforms that are needed. And I was going to ask you, like, let's assuming that you had a like a best case scenario, and you had a government in place after the next elections that didn't have to worry about, you know, the pressures of politics. Are there some low hanging fruit that a reformer can say? Okay, let me fix these two or three things. That will make a huge difference to the Indian economy. I mean, can I cancel this subsidy, for example? Uh, can I unblock this regulation? Uh, can I uh, say that you can have uh, uh, four SEZs in these cities and things like that? I mean, are there, are there some kind of low hanging Yeah, I think there are. You know, one of the things is that uh, during an election in India, uh, particularly in the last two or three months or so, uh, many things that are in the pipeline, uh, more or less by the regulation of the Chief Election Commissioner, stop happening. Mm -hmm. You're not actually supposed to implement these things. Mm -hmm. Now, as it happens, uh, I think there's a lot which is in the pipeline, which if a new government were willing to do, and I think the chances are very good that they would do that, mm -hmm. uh, it would be easy for them to give people a very clear signal that they mean business. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, uh, for a long time, we've been debating the introduction of a proper value-added tax, and what we call a goods and services tax. Mm -hmm. It really integrates what is at the moment a very inefficient state and central tax system into a parallel system which would work exactly like a value-added tax. Now, businessmen tell me that if we introduce that, that alone would add one percentage point to the growth of GDP. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I believe there is a very, very wide consensus at the political level that we need this tax. It just didn't happen because before an election, nobody wanted to as we reach agreement. So my, my assumption is that when a new government comes into play, uh, it will be there by the end of May, uh, that would be the easiest thing for them to move on. There's virtually no opposition uh, of the political kind. Uh, to the goods and service tax. Second, uh, I think we've made a lot of progress on energy pricing. Uh, we deregulated petrol prices. We gradually adjusted diesel prices. Mm. I think uh, we're moving subsidies. Well, they just you know they were held low artificially. Global prices had increased. We didn't actually allow the diesel price to rise. So you can call that a subsidy. But some of it is. A, is explicitly paid as a subsidy, but some of it is simply not paying the petroleum companies mm. what would be the proper price if you align with world prices. We've decided on adjustments that are needed in gas pricing. Mm. And I think that, you know, uh, some of this has got held back. People are wondering whether this is going to continue. I think a new government could clearly say that, look, uh, within we're, we're going to continue with the process of gradual adjustments in energy prices. Mm. I think, for example, on environmental, uh, you know, regulatory restrictions, quite a lot has already been done, uh, and I think it needs to be systematized. A new government could very easily say that, look, large projects have been held up through lack of clarity in how environmental regulation should function. I mean, nobody's going to say, by the way, that environmental regulation doesn't matter. In India, I think the problem is not that uh, people, we should get rid of environmental regulation. The problem is the regulations are poorly drafted, they're vague, and they allow anyone who wants to stop the project mm -hmm. referring to some aspect of it and saying this needs to be looked at again. But it should be made totally transparent. And I think the corporate sector, both public sector and private sector, also have to be totally clear that, look, it's now been clarified, so don't try to cut corners. Mm -hmm. I think a new government could very easily do Mm. These are things that could be done in the next three months, mm. basically. After the new government comes in. After the new government. I mean, it will present a budget in the, in the very first month mm -hmm. of its uh, being in power, probably at the end of June or maybe early July. And that becomes a policy, the statement of policy of the new government. You know, the things that were highly controversial, let's say, during the election, there is a sort of unwritten kind of thing that a new government has uh, has a mandate, and therefore what it does in the first six months, and it clearly indicates it's going to do it, that would not by itself be controversial, in my view. Great. Questions? Who's going to be the first one? 
you. Go ahead, please. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, there are some commentators. Can you please yourself. Oh, sure. um, Andrew Wong. Uh, there are some commentators who believe an important part of the post GFC story has been the uh, unconventional monetary policy of the major central banks and the effect that has had on liquidity conditions in the world that have led to massive investments into the global carry trade. Support Tucker last week was here and he spoke about this. Um, and that this has led to, among other things, extensive credit growth, um, perhaps some unhealthy financial developments in shadow banking. Um, but that now that the Fed is tapering and various emerging market central banks are raising interest rates across the board, um, that's an important part of the dimension of concern about the emerging market story. How much of this is true and is it relevant? Well, I'm sure that the uh, transition away from what was earlier a very loose monetary policy in the advanced countries to something a, a little bit tighter is going to be important in terms of the availability of capital. But you know, if, if I were thinking specifically of India, I think that's we can handle that because we are in any case not, we're not in favor of financing large deficits by borrowed money. I mean, we ought to be bringing our own fiscal deficit down. The availability of resources domestically, if we can bring the fiscal deficit down, uh, will offset any possible shock uh, that might come from uh, the, uh, the withdrawal of the taper. Now, the assumption here is that the withdrawal of the taper is being signaled uh, it will be calibrated. Uh, of course, you know, there are debates going on even in the U.S. as to whether they're doing it too fast. Now, one, one issue is, will this lead to too slow growth in the advanced countries? That's one part. I'm not, I mean, I think the different, uh, I'm not sufficiently expert on that. My own guess is that, at least in the United States, there is a recovery underway. Uh, I don't think that the withdrawal of the taper will affect the U.S. all that much. Yes, it will certainly it'll raise interest rates. Short-term interest rates for countries will go up. But we're not that dependent on short-term interest rates. We're actually much more dependent, much more keen to attract proper FDI. Now, you know, whether, whether the slight rise in the interest rates in the West would prevent people from engaging in foreign direct investment in developing countries, I think that factor is, uh, that, uh, is determined much more by what the growth prospect of the developing countries is. And certainly I would say that for India. So at the scale at which we are operating, uh, I don't worry too much uh, on that score. But at the same time, there was, uh, you know, when the Fed first announced taper, mm -hmm. the rupee took a massive hit. It went down to 67, I think. No, that's true. Uh, but you see, why, why, I mean, if India was so strong, why was it, why did the market well, hit so strong? A very good question. India wasn't that strong last year. Because, you know, last year, the account account deficit was about 4.7% of GDP. So we were, and, and secondly, for a variety of reasons, we had got stuck with a real effective exchange rate, which had appreciated. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rupee was, by most uh, real effective exchange rate criteria, uh, in real terms, appreciated when the taper was withdrawn last year. So you had a rupee that was appreciated, a large current account deficit, withdrawal of taper, shock reaction. Today you've got a situation where, first of all, the current account deficit is down to about 2%. Mm -hmm. So we are in a very different position from what we were when the taper began. Uh, and secondly, the fiscal deficit is beginning to get under control. And thirdly, the rupee is now not in an over, excessively overvalued position. I mean, the very fact that we allowed the rupee to adjust uh, puts India in a stronger position. Uh, it was it was a sitting duck uh, mm -hmm. at whatever 48 rupees to the dollar. Yeah. At 60 plus is not a sitting duck. Mm -hmm. Wait, please. Uh, so good evening. My name is Rohit. Uh, just want to take a question further. Uh, build on the question which uh, Dean Kishore asked about subsidies. Uh, if you were to bring subsidies under control, in particular the world's largest food subsidy bill uh, and a few other yojanas uh, which are in India, what percentage points could this add to the growth uh, of the GDP? Well, you know, there's no question that we need to bring subsidies under control. Um, I wouldn't necessarily start with a food subsidy. Uh, that politically is, many people think, a very crucial subsidy. In my view, if we have to get rid of subsidies, we should get rid of energy subsidies. 
they're dysfunctional, they're bad for the economy, and they're large. So quite frankly, I mean, we've said in the 12th plan calculations that we need to chop off uh, one percentage point of GDP from the subsidy bill, and most of it should really come from energy subsidies. Okay, I'll give the lady a question, and I'll come to you at the back there. Please. Good evening, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. So yeah. I'm um, Renalini. I'm a student, MBA student here at the LKY School. Um, I wanted to ask you one question on corruption. Uh, one issue that plagues many of the emerging economies, including India, is high levels of corruption. And one area where it hinders progress is in the ease of doing business. So what future do you see for emerging economies on the front of curbing corruption? Thank you. Well, there's no question that, you know, uh, public perception and willingness to talk uh, as is one where they, they perceive corruption as a problem, and that's really the other side of the government's problem. Uh, and we have to fix it. Uh, now, you know, uh, as you, I think it's not just an Indian problem, it's there everywhere. We're not the most corrupt country according to most of these rankings. We do figure somewhere in the middle. I'd like us to figure amongst the least corrupt, that regrettably is not where we are. But I think that we have to do that, and really there are two ways of doing it. I mean, one is, of course, uh, you know, you make sure that the punitive side of it uh, is seen to work better and more effectively. Uh, that actually requires quite a lot of retooling of, you know, how the judicial system works, etc. and there's lots of efforts being made to do that. In a way, more important is to change the system so that corruption is discouraged ab initio. And I think we need to retool the system. One of the things that happens is with transparency. I mean, the more transparent it is, the, le le uh, the more difficult it is for anyone to get away with corruption. So you need to operate on both fronts. I think, by the way, that quite a lot uh, that can be done. Uh, I think in India, one of the, one of the facts that uh, we have to keep in mind is that uh, awareness about corruption has become much higher because of instruments like the Right to Information Act, etc. So you can't keep things hidden. So in some sense, uh, this revealing what's going on, the whistleblowing and all the rest of it, is actually serving a productive purpose. And we need to respond to that. And not just counting on punitive action. I mean, we have to, we have to change the system so that the likelihood of corrupt actions taking place is reduced. Great. Thank you. Gentlemen, like that. Uh, can we get a translator? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can we get a translator? Uh, not fast. Okay, we can translate this. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, okay, I'm the uh, well, we read from the news that uh, Prime Minister Li Keqiang yesterday uh, met the IMF experts, then he used the description of the Oh, three years and three parts. Three years and three what? And three parts. B U T. Three parts. B U T. Ah, 其中就说到这个新兴市新兴市场国家面临呃困难和挑战，但是仍然是世界经济重要增长力量。So one of the main points that he mentioned that the emerging market, although faced the challenge, but is still one of the most promising markets in the world. 应该说，中国和印度同是发展中国家，同是新兴市场国家。So both China and India belongs to emerging markets. 呃，您呃，对中国和印度下一步的这个经济合作，呃，包括金融，呃，包括这个产业，包括这个技术合作，如何突破这个政治分歧，呃，来开展下一步的这个我们这个开放合作，呃，您是怎么看？ So may I know your opinion on how the India and China can cooperate in view of the finance, the economics, and out of the box of the political disputes? If, more precisely, if 
，呃，我们有意向在中国某个地方，呃，像西藏、西藏或者云南的广西，建立一个中中印这个开放合作的试验区，您是否感兴趣？ So in case there is opportunity that in China, for example, in Tibet or in Yunnan, that we open up the space to have the industrial zone for India. Do you think that India will have the interest? Well, it's uh, you're bearing out Dean Mabubani's dream that uh, Singapore becomes a meeting ground for India and China. And let me say, I agree with what you said. And it's happening. It's happening. I was in China last week and I had the privilege of calling on the Prime Minister. Uh, we were Prime Minister Li Keqiang. Yeah. yeah. You uh, called him. And he strongly endorsed the proposition, exactly what you say. Both India and China are emerging economies and we ought to cooperate much more. In fact, I said to the Prime Minister that we greatly admire what China has done in the economic field and you know, we hope that we can actually do something similar. On bilateral economic matters, I must tell you that India and China cooperation going extremely well. I mean, only a few years ago, trade was only about 3 billion and it's now gone up to about 70 billion. Of course, uh, we are running a rather large deficit vis-a-vis -vis China and we hope that we'll be able to correct that. We are welcoming Chinese investment into India. I, I mean, we have set up little groups that will try to promote that. Uh, we are, a lot of Indian companies are investing in China, so there are major Indian companies operating in China. Chinese companies are welcome to operate in India, and we just hope that that will actually continue. Um, you know, globally, of course, we have similar interest in how the global economy should move, and I'm sure that my Chinese counterpart in the G20, uh, I should meet up with him to see if we can collaborate a little better. But you know, the global I collaboration... Tell him about Singapore. I'll tell you about Singapore. No, about Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. So anyway, we have 10 more minutes to go. Can we have, if you don't mind, a five of you, all five of you can ask questions. You know mind. We'll just take quick, take quick notes. Yes, while well, I'm doing that, and I'll do a quick And then quick, uh, we start, in case of a set the pace, short, sharp question. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Keshava from the LKY School. Um, just a short question on energy. You mentioned it being imperative for economic growth, but uh, India's oil imports contribute quite a bit to the current account deficit. Does the Planning Commission have any uh, plans to correct this? And secondly, for the gas prices, uh, would it, are there any ways to correct that? I think it's in quite a mess now. Uh, thanks so much. Okay. Next question, and then we'll come to you yeah, quickly. Thank you for your uh, for coming today. A quick question, hopefully. Introduce yourself. Um, I'm Abhilasha. Uh, Abhilasha Mishra. I would, uh, I'm an ex-banker, so worked in the field, and I remember when the crisis happened, everybody was talking about the effect of decoupling and the worry about how <coughs> markets would survive, the emerging markets. And of course, the new term decoupling arose because they said, although 60% of um, demand was in the US, China had a huge, had a huge uh, internal economy to sustain it. India has a fantastic internal economy to sustain it. How did China do better? Because when the markets went down, vis-a-vis -vis India, what is it that China had that India couldn't do? We had the same domestic um, demand. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next question. I'm trying to. Try and keep it brief. Uh, in your talk, you mentioned you alluded to the BRIC markets. There has been in recent times mention of pine markets, Philippines, Indonesia, Nigeria, Ethiopia. I wanted to get your thoughts more on the NE, the Africa part of it. We have seen China investing quite heavily in Africa. And perhaps if you can share your thoughts on what India is doing externally, I think you mentioned top priorities internally in terms of water, infrastructure, urban planning. Um, it will be great to hear if India also intends to focus externally on some things that will positively influence growth. Good. Next question. Hi, good evening. My name is Murin Moy Das. I'm from Indu. I'm uh, working in oil and gas. My question is very brief. Uh, does high growth rate truly reflect the development? If you think so, then what uh, other factor you want to include? Does high growth rate truly reflect development? Yes. Okay. Next question. Hi, my name is Yoshihiro Mitsukuda from Japan. I'm a minister of uh, Japanese government. So, and fortunately, India and Japan have a very good relationship now. And then, so in the 
Japan have uh, some um, is the best of land scaling uh, uh, is the uh, clean air, uh, water and clean uh, air. So then, um, and not only government, uh, uh, but also many uh, is the uh, company is a focus to uh, biggest uh, democratic country in the world in your country. So, um, in the India, what you want, what uh, for to um, uh, Japan? So not not only investment. So. That's all. Thank you. What was your question again? I'm saying, you said India is the biggest democracy. Can you just give the question for what's the question? What's the question? Oh, that's the question is, uh, is that, of course, in Japan and government and uh, company in the interest in the Japan, uh, Indian uh, investment, but Japan have uh, not only investment, but some uh, methods of uh, uh, green energy and uh, green water and uh, pollution. Oh, yeah. So green yeah. energy, yeah. yeah. So what? How can you cooperate? Okay, with that's energy? pretty good. Um, well, five quick questions. Lots of questions on energy. Can you finish at six thirty? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. uh, that's okay. I, uh, you know, I think on energy, we regard that as a very major uh, long-term challenge. And actually, since you're all interested in energy. This enables me to do a little uh, publicity uh, for what we've been doing. Because in the Planning Commission, uh, we've produced uh, a long-term forecasting method, uh, which would feed into a model uh, all kinds of assumptions about energy demand, uh, different assumptions about energy efficiency for different sectors, uh, and different assumptions about energy supply. Uh, and it's an interactive model on our website. So if you're in, you, you ask me, what is the planning commission doing? <coughs> well, in the first instance, we have put on the web something called the India Alternate Energy Pathways, which is an interactive tool which would enable you to choose a lot of alternative assumptions and see what they apply for India. And actually what we find is that you know, there's no way that we can manage the energy system without very major efforts, on the one hand, at reducing the demand for energy by increasing energy uh, efficiency. And that goes down into lots and lots of details about what you have to do. And then you have to ask yourself, can we actually do that? And in order to reduce energy dependence, I mean, it, we, we, we have a sort of uh, a projection of business as usual, and the terminal year that we use is 2047. Uh, it's three years short of the usual climate change 2050, and it happens to be India's 100th anniversary of independence. So we thought we'd use 2047 as our terminal year. And we find that if we just do a business as usual, import dependence would increase from 31% to 84%. Totally unsustainable. Wow. Okay. 31 to 84. But, yeah, I mean, that, that just not a sustain. That was in order to say that, look, this is not possible. Yeah. So then we explore a whole lot of alternatives, and we find that it can actually be brought down to 21%. But for that, you have to do a huge amount of work on renewable energy, wind, solar, you know, biofuels, etc. Plus, of course, a lot of work in reducing energy demand. So uh, if you're interested in what the Planning Commission is doing, my suggestion is go to the Planning Commission website. And somewhere in the right-hand lower corner of the website, there you'll see energy, energy scenarios. Click on that and play around with the model and send me your comments. It'll give you all the detail, not one single alternative, but it lays out uh, what the choices are before the government. And we have to we have to sort of implement that. You know, we are we made this public, we a new government will be in power, we will have a midterm appraisal by the end of the year. We are hoping with a public debate we get a better understanding of whether people understand what these energy choices are and are we willing to take the tough decisions uh, necessary. On gas prices, somebody said, uh, what's the, you know, the gas price problem is that, you know, we had a gas price uh, which is g fixed by government at about $4.25 per million BTU. We're importing gas at $15 to $16 per million BTU. Uh, That's uh, a huge subsidy. Well, well our, what our producers say 
is that you're not paying us what is our due, and if this is what you're going to pay, we're just not going to invest. Period. Mm. So it's not that we are, we're not paying them sixteen dollars and mm. charging the consumer for. Mm. We're sort of big, because uh, the gas price was controlled. Now we have suggested that we should move to a formula where the gas price would be linked to global prices. That that went through a whole lot of uh, discussion, and there is. Uh, a recommendation which has actually been approved by the cabinet that the four dollars should be raised to eight dollars. Now remember gas is not like oil. I mean for example the gas price in the United States is three dollars because the US doesn't allow gas to be exported. Mm -hmm. So the Japanese pay sixteen dollars, the Europeans pay ten to twelve dollars, the, the Americans don't allow their gas to be exported so they benefit by getting two to three dollars and we have to decide how do we price our gas. So it's a very fragmented market. But it's quite clear to me that we will have to go to something like $8. And by the way, if the US were to abolish their import uh, export uh, control, uh, the global gas prices would settle around $8 to $9. And we, we have, in fact, taken those steps uh, to fix that. Now, at the moment, I believe, because the election is going on, uh, is not going to be implemented until the election is over, but that's the decision. So I think it's a tough decision, but we've actually taken. Now, a good question on why did China do better? I think it's important, uh, in the Chinese case, I mean, they were, they were hit by the slowdown in external demand for their exports, and they reacted through a domestic stimulus by a really large investment in things like housing, etc. In India's case, the slowdown is not due to the impact on exports. The slowdown is due to domestic constraints on the supply side, which actually held back investment. A lot of investment was going on in large infrastructure projects, but then regulatory clearances, etc., got complicated. So these projects wouldn't move forward, and we've actually tried to unblock those. Uh, in our case, the other constraint really is that Unlike China, which has more than enough financing, India suffers from the financing constraints also. So I don't think that India's problems could have been easily solved simply by resorting to a domestic stimulus. Actually, we did that in response to the first crisis. And as I pointed out in my presentation, India's growth rate after the, in the first three years of uh, post-crisis, post Lehman Brothers crisis, was actually better than in the six or seven years before that. But you know you can't keep doing the stimulus, so we ran out of room for maneuver. And I think the latest problems are dominantly problems on the supply side, which have held up investment and have caused investors to lower their activity. More complicated than the case of China, we have to, we have to handle that somehow. And I think that lots of steps have been taken. So, I'm hopeful that post the new government, uh, you will, you'll be in a much better position. China is certainly investing a lot in Africa. We are also interested in Africa. We can't compete with China in the investments because it's simply a re I mean, we're, we're, uh, China is a capital surplus country. Uh, they have a huge savings rate. And they don't want to have that high an investment rate. They have three trillion dollars in reserves. They're exactly that. So I mean, they you know, but India is very much engaged in Africa and wants to stay engaged in Africa. But we're not investing anything like this on the scale that China is doing. Um, some, I think the gentleman over there asked the question, that, do you think high growth is equal to development? No, I, I would say we clearly regard high growth as essential for development. I mean, at our level of per capita income, if we don't raise the per capita income, there's no development. But it's possible to have a growth which doesn't lead to development if it's not inclusive. So actually, our objective is not high growth. It's rapid, inclusive, and sustainable growth. So well, the rapid growth, I read out all the stuff that's necessary for that. There's lots that we're trying to do to make the growth inclusive. And sustainability is something which this energy pathways exercise uh, does bring out very sharply. You know, there is scope for moving towards green energy in the long term. But it's going to require a lot of investment, and it's actually costlier than conventional energy. But we have to make that transition somehow. Uh, and I think the same thing holds on the Japan, India. Uh, we are very interested, actually, in collaborating with Japan on the clean energy and renewable energy areas. 
In fact, I co-chair the India-Japan Energy Dialogue, and in that process, uh, we are engaging with the Japanese in a lot of stuff, both on reducing energy, uh, I mean, increasing energy efficiency, and we're trying to get some of the work that would enable the investment to take place in clean energy, particularly in photovoltaic. I mean, that's an area that we think uh, has large potential in India, and we're very keen to attract people to come and invest uh, in that sector. You know, one of our key missions of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy is to produce the next generation of Asian leaders. But to produce the next generation of Asian leaders, we need good Asian role models that our students could try to emulate. And I can tell you, Montek, there's no better role model than you for our students. You demonstrated it today with your answers, and we thank you very, very much.